today I'm going to talk about water scarcity. But this talk isn't going to be about places like California or the Southwest where water has always been scarce. This talk is about water, places where water seems to be everywhere. Places like here in Mississippi. Now water law is complicated and its depth goes beyond what I could talk about in this talk here today. But I do want to talk about how the law is flawed in a couple of fundamental ways. First, the law is a system that's focused on use. So the law asks, who is using water now and for what purpose? Not, what water are we going to need in the future? Not, are we using water in a way that's sustainable? Also, water law isn't progressive. And so it was initially based on a complete lack of scientific understanding of water resources. So in a lot of places, we thought water was limitless. And so the law allows people to use water in inefficient and unsustainable ways, creating water scarcity problems. The problem is, as the law has developed, it has not kept pace with this evolving scientific understanding of water resources. So the question then becomes, how are we going to change these policies? Now, we can't talk about water law without noting that the laws and policies in the United States have developed in two completely different regions, the dry west and the water-rich east. The west, as most of you know, has always had water supply issues. Their water doctrine is complex and more developed. So in the west, certain amounts of each waterway are allocated to individual users. And so you can think of those users in line with a bucket in their hands at a stream. The first person gets to step up to the stream, fill their bucket up with the amount of water the state has given them. Then the next person gets to go, and on and on until everyone gets their turn. But if the water is gone by the time it's your turn, you're completely out of luck. Your right is completely dependent on whether there's any water left to give. So how does this work? In the West, there's a lot of waterways that have no water left in them. So when you picture the Colorado River in your head, are you thinking of this vast, mighty river that carved the Grand Canyon? Because today, so many people are allowed to use and take water from the Colorado River that the river rarely reaches the ocean. It goes dry before it gets there. This is complete comparison to the East, which has always been considered water rich. So in the East, people who live on the water are called riparians, and they all get to use the water as they like, as long as it's reasonable and it doesn't hurt other users. So this means until there's a problem, no one's really caring about how you're using water. So I grew up where a river meets a bay in New Jersey, and the idea that that river would run dry before it hit the bay would have never crossed my mind. It's just not a situation we ever think about in this part of the country. Now, I've been talking about water for a couple minutes, and what image has been popping into your mind when I say water? Is it the ocean, a flowing river, maybe a waterfall? Because that's what we usually think of, surface water. We're taught in school, after all, that the world is covered with water. And while this is true, only a small fraction of that water is usable fresh water. In fact, only 2.5% of the world's water is usable fresh water. And of this small amount, over 68% is trapped in glaciers and ice caps. Only 1.2% of this teeny percentage is surface water, water on the surface of the earth in rivers, lakes, and streams. The rest, 30%, is groundwater, water beneath the Earth's surface and sources like aquifers. So here in Mississippi, over 90% of the water we're using on a day-to-day -day basis is groundwater. So we're not pulling waters from rivers and streams here. We're pumping it up from underground. There's an issue, though, in that water law has mostly been focused on surface water. We know how much we had, and we know when we run out of it. We can see overuse because the river runs dry. This is compared to groundwater, which we can't see. And so we, for a long time, had no idea how this resource worked. We didn't know its scientific dynamics. You add this to the fact 
in a lot of places there is or was a lot of brown water, enough for us to use for long periods into the future. And we created this illusion that the resource was limitless. Because of this, we allowed people to pump up as much water as they wanted with little thought about what the repercussions of that pumping would be. The problem is we now know that overpumping has a lot of serious consequences. So when we overpump groundwater, the land can sink, ecosystems and habitats can be negatively affected, and in coastal areas, salt water can actually intrude the aquifer, polluting our drinking water, and harming croplands. And for individual landowners, there are serious economic consequences. As the water table is lowered, you're going to need a deeper well to access the water. So if you're overpumping yourself on your own property, you may be able to reduce this kind of trend and stop pumping so much. But if your neighbor's overpumping, they may actually be pulling water out from underneath your property lowering your water table, requiring you to get a deeper well. And if this happens, you'd want your neighbor to kind of stop, right? Well, that's what's currently happening between Mississippi and Tennessee. So think of these people not as people, but states. And interstate water disputes are common. States are allowed to negotiate how they want to share water resources that cross state borders. But when the states disagree, their disputes can only be resolved by the Supreme Court of the United States. So the Mississippi-Tennessee Supreme Court case that's currently happening is about an aquifer that underlies several states in our region, including Mississippi and Tennessee. Both states pump water from this aquifer, but Memphis pumps its water very close to the border between Mississippi and Tennessee. So Mississippi is claiming that Memphis is actually pulling water out from underneath Mississippi and if the court agrees with Mississippi on this point, Tennessee would have to pay Mississippi money and stop pumping in this way. Tennessee is saying this is an interstate resource. And if the court agrees with Tennessee on this part, point, neither state would have any right to the water until the court gives it to them. So how would the court do this? You could think of each state at a table with a glass while the court holds a pitcher of water. The court's going to then pour out that pitcher into each glass, telling each state how much they can get. But the court is not just going to split the water equally. They're going to take into account who needs the water now and for what purpose. So it's possible that Memphis taking the water out from underneath northern Mississippi is completely okay under the law if Memphis needs that water now, and this is what the court thinks is fair. The issue is whether the court rules in favor of Mississippi or Tennessee, is it really going to affect how people are using water in our states? Is it going to address water scarcity problems? Now, if you remember, I started by saying that the law is focused on use. It's focused on present use, not the future. It's not concerned about how big Memphis or South Haven or the University of Mississippi is going to be in the future concerned about how we're using water here and now. The truth is we need better laws and policies that don't allow us to overuse water and create scarcity problems where we don't have them. It's easy for me here to stand and say these laws and policies are flawed, but it's harder for us to begin to think about how we're going to change these policies. So there's a lot of brilliant people right now we're working on how we're going to get more water. We're thinking about injecting water back into aquifers or taking the salt out of salt water so we can use it. But there's another solution to this problem, and it's right in front of us, in plain sight. We could all start using less water. But how do we do this? How do we change this mindset we all have that water is limitless? For us individuals, Water is basically free. So if you have a water company, most of your bill is actually based on moving the water to you. Only a little bit is based on your actual water use. But we also can't increase the cost of water or tax it like we would a luxury car that guzzles gas 
because water isn't a luxury good. It's essential to our survival. When we're thinking about sector uses like farmers, who as an industry use a huge amount of water, but who are also using that water to raise crops that are feeding the rest of us, how much of this burden are we going to be willing to place on them? Are we going to be willing to support them if these changes hurt them economically? When you think about state policymakers, how are we going to get them to kind of use these tools that are at their disposal, like underutilized permitting systems, to help curtail our use? How are we going to get them to help us think about how we're going to more efficiently use water in this state? Because the reality is, while we once thought that water was limitless, reality is telling us that's no longer the case. And this problem's only going to get worse in the future. Our populations are expected to grow. Our climates are expected to get hotter, with longer periods of drought between rain events. Our already depleted resources are only going to become further stressed. We have a water scarcity problem in places like here in Mississippi because we're overusing water. And the first step, I think, for all of us to at least be aware that this problem exists, because until we all start thinking about how we're going to start using water like it's limitless and creating scarcity problems where we shouldn't have them, we're not going to be able to move forward and create more sustainable water policies. Thank you. Thank you.